who's just given us a, a, a thumbnail sketch of, of the rich science behind climate change, brought it home, at least home to many of us who, have, uh, who are on the shoreline. Um, and uh, there's a lot of material there to, 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 to digest. And uh, to bring it home, to bring it more uh, intimate home to uh, us in public health um, is uh, Dr. Abramson, uh, who uh, comes to us from Columbia. Uh, he uh, works on the, in the uh, Columbia uh, Center for, uh, I have to read it here properly, Columbia Center. Uh, Center for <coughs> Disaster, National Center for Disaster Preparedness. He is the director of research. Uh, he's also dealt extensively with disaster recovery and resiliency. Uh, he's, uh, he will share with you uh, his experiences and, and information, particularly in regards to uh, Katrina and other events. Uh, what Dr. Aberson, uh We've had an opportunity to talk and work with him a little bit in the past few weeks, and um, he's just uh, shown a very brilliant insight in terms of those things that we have to deal with in public health as related to these disasters. He also has extensive experience in other aspects of public health, a rounding aspect of public health, uh, and working with HIV and, and uh, other uh, issues. He comes with the extensive experience not only in academia but in but in the media as well because he served as a as a uh, as a reporter for uh, Rolling Stone, uh, Esquire, Outside, uh, San Francisco Examiner, and the like. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Joseph Abramson, who will uh, Dave Abramson, who will who will uh, give us a talk on the uh, public health impact of uh, hurricanes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Good morning, everybody. There was a healthy good morning. Good morning. OK, so I'd like to speak uh, about Hurricane Katrina. And you may be wondering, why are we going to talk about Hurricane Katrina? Haven't we talked about this enough? Haven't we talked about this before? What is the value of talking about a Gulf Coast storm to a Northeast crowd? Could it possibly happen here? Why would we care? There was a, an article in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine this week, which was very interesting. It's kind of a little bit off topic than, than hurricanes. It was uh, an OBGYN writing about something that she called the value of the adverse anecdote. And she said this is, uh, she had been trained to uh, live and breathe evidence-based medicine, and she looked at randomized clinical trials and tried to use that to inform her clinical practice. But when it really came down to it, what informed her practice the most was what she called these adverse anecdotes, when everything went horribly wrong and she had to deal with it. Whatever the, the issue was in the, in the middle of uh, delivery, let's say, uh, and something that she had not expected presented itself. And that's, that became the key learning moment for her and what she in turn ended up transmitting more and more to the residents who came to train with her was the use of the adverse anecdote. And in some sort of strange level of magnitude, Hurricane Katrina is an enormous adverse anecdote. It's what some people would call the black swan event, the event that has an incredibly low probability and an incredibly high consequence, such that you can't even really figure what the true probability is of that event occurring. But if that event does occur and all things go wrong and events begin to cascade, all of a sudden you're faced with a disaster of catastrophic proportions, and it tends to move our thinking more so than the everyday events that we deal with. And so for all those reasons, I would say Hurricane Katrina is something reasonable for us to talk about. 
So this was the, uh, the report that uh, a lot of people got on their Blackberries and on various other text devices the day before Hurricane Katrina hit. Most of the area will be uninhabitable for weeks, perhaps longer, human suffering incredible by modern standards. This was a report from the National Weather Service, who if you read most of the National Weather Service reports, they never get that dramatic, ever. So the fact that they decided this was something that we should be paying attention to and we have to really be clear that it's something that everybody has to heed is a, an enormous wake-up call. And so the, the images that I'm about to show you of Hurricane Katrina, the, the aftermath, the, uh, the devastation, these are probably things that you've already seen, but I just want us to think about this for a moment and think about the Category 3 hurricane that could potentially hit in the Long Island Sound region. As we just heard from Dr. Gornitz, there's you know, perhaps a slightly greater likelihood of it occurring, and if it occurs, a slightly greater likelihood of it being of greater intensity. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but we could assume that uh, it could exceed our expectations. And in fact, that's what I want to spend some time thinking about here is what happens when events exceed our expectations. I think a lot of you are very comfortable and capable in dealing with the technical aspects of things that you expect to occur, because that's what you plan for. But what I'm going to describe for you is how public health and the people in the Gulf Coast responded and reacted to things that they really didn't expect. When we look at uh, what happened in Japan with the Fukushima nuclear power plant, you could see a series of cascading failures, things that you know, on the face of it, you could say, well, I could kind of understand how each one of the events would occur. You have the 9.0 earthquake, you have the tsunami, you could see how these things would be linked, clearly, no doubt. You could see the storm surge, you could see the flooding. You might not have thought about what was going to happen when the flooding hit the island. Obviously, they didn't plan for all the things that occurred, and we watched as all of these unanticipated events came to be. So these, these are the, the pictures of destruction in the Gulf Coast. They're the same kind of pictures you would see from any catastrophic wind and flooding, of, <clears throat> excuse me, wind and flooding event. I would suggest that you entertain the thought of, could it happen in our area? And the answer is at least entertain the possibility that yes, it could. This is charity, big charity hospital. This was a, uh, uh, a clinic for patients and uh, how the, the clinic office decided to alert the patients where to find the doctor. And then these were obviously the, the trailer parks that were uh, established afterwards. So when we look at uh, Katrina by the numbers, we see that there was uh, landfall on August 29th as a strong Category 3. At some point, it was uh, Category 5 when it was out off the Florida coast. As it approached, it was downgraded to a Category 4. When it hit somewhere around Waveland Bay, St. Louis, in, in the, the Gulf of Mississippi, it was a Category 3, a strong Category 3. There are at least 1,800 deaths that were attributable to the hurricane. It affected an area approximately the size of Great Britain, it, it, an enormous area. Uh, in contrast, Hurricane Andrew hit uh, an area of a couple of hundred square square miles. So this was, by magnitudes, the largest uh, hurricane in terms of its reach. Uh, one and a half million people evacuated prior to the landfall, and the damage estimates were uh, exceeded $150 billion. So by the numbers, it's an enormous event. It's the black swan event. So what was Katrina's impact on public health? And some of the things that we're going to spend a little bit of of time talking about are the organizational response of how public health organized itself, the culture that it had there, uh, and how it was prepared for this or not prepared, uh, the personal response of public health providers, what it's going to feel like for you if you're in that situation where this kind of storm is barreling down and hitting you, the problems that they faced, 
They could have been the direct effects on health and environment. There are clearly many very specific direct effects that we will be speaking about. There are indirect effects of the hurricane and the displacement that lingered for years and that I would suggest may be as bad and uh, deleterious as the direct effects. You have organizational effects. How does this affect the organization of public health in terms of access to supplies, resources, supply chain, personnel and workforce, which became an enormous issue, communication and what were the problems that people experienced with communication, and overall system problems in terms of how people were able to coordinate or not coordinate with many other players. This was beyond a regional problem. This was a regional federal problem. So you had players from all levels present um, attempting to uh, coordinate and integrate their work. And then lastly and most importantly, we're going to talk about some of the population impacts, both in terms of short-term and more long-term recovery impacts. So there, there are three basic sources that I want to use for today's discussion. The first is uh, an oral history project that uh, some colleagues and I conducted in 2007, where we interviewed 44 public health officials in the states of Louisiana and Mississippi, and also the city of New Orleans Health Department. And we pretty much focused on senior level, top managers, et cetera, a couple of line staff uh, in those areas. The second is the Gulf Coast Child and Family Health Study, which is something that we began uh, in, within six months after the hurricane. You'll hear more about it. It's a longitudinal cohort study in which we've recruited over 1,000 households in Louisiana, Mississippi, and we've been following them over time. And uh, the last time we went back to talk to them was uh, uh, the end of 09, beginning of 2010. And then the last is the Life Story Project. Uh, which was our effort to uh, conduct an intervention. It turns out that the intervention did not prove to be efficacious, but uh, if time permits at the end, I'd like to play you a little snippet from the life stories, which is a very dramatic um, recounting of how people were affected by the hurricane. So first, let's talk about the Oral History Project. And what this really represents is the voices of the senior public health officials uh, in Louisiana and Mississippi. So let's begin with how these two states are very similar. Um, they both have centralized public health uh, with regional and a district structure, so they don't have local health departments outside of the city of New Orleans being a, uh, an autonomous local health agency. Both of the states have a strong central structure. Secondly, they're very poor states and they uh, often have a race to the bottom for uh, health statistics. Uh, so you, you've already got an incredibly vulnerable, chronically ill population. Uh, and you have a population that has a uh, lack of access, lack of insurance, high degrees of disability, etc. Uh, and then you also have two states with a great deal of difference between upstate, downstate, uh, which uh, I can at least say from New York is something that we're well aware of as well, although in an opposite fashion perhaps. Here you've got, um, well maybe not so opposite, here you've got uh, the capitals of both Louisiana and Mississippi and the northern, north of uh, their southern coastal cities, uh, and not always a great deal of connection from state to those local areas. This is a very a critical feature if you're going to have a state-run system and the event centering on a locality that doesn't have that kind of strong connection. But there are differences as well. There were huge differences between the two governors of Louisiana and Mississippi. The governor of Louisiana, uh, Blanco, was a Democrat, uh, relatively new to, the, to uh, power, uh, without a lot of uh, really political connection to the governing Republican administration in the White House. On the other hand, uh, you had Haley Barber, the governor of Mississippi, uh, a Republican, former chair of the Republican National Committee with a very strong connection to the Republican administration and very savvy in terms of uh, how to make things happen. There was clearly a greater impact in Louisiana with a significant hit to their largest city. And then there are varying priorities between the two states 
uh, with how they organize themselves. And Louisiana puts a lot more emphasis on special needs shelters and the public health responsibility for that than does Mississippi. And you're going to hear other differences between the two states. When you look at the organizational structure of these two states, um, you can see that the person who's going to be the incident commander uh, is a couple of levels down from either the Secretary of Health or the State Health Officer. It's one or two levels down. Um, and in Mississippi, they actually created um, the Director of Health Protection with a lot more direct responsibility for, with a more direct reports on a day-to-day -day basis for a lot of the health department than in Louisiana. And that probably has some ramification here. So what I'm about to do is I'm going to give you now the words of some of the people that we talk to. Uh, you're now going to be seeing it's a lot of text. I'm going to read it, but I want you to begin hearing the words of these public health officials and hear yourself in this as well, because I imagine that a lot of you may recognize, if not someone specific, a way of thinking about things. So the Louisiana incident commander says, we spend time on training for disasters, and all along the way, I keep telling people we would only do things which would help us through any event, but that it would also improve our ability to do things on a daily basis. So we spend a lot of time training people, getting them ready for major events, and at the same time, improving how they do their daily work. What we did over three years is that every administrator in public health in the regions, every medical director that we recruited had to go through these leadership training courses. Part of the training course is how do you become a leader in your community. Okay, so that's, that's one approach to inculcating public health leadership in an emergency. Take your existing staff, train them up in emergency preparedness and response. Let's look at Mississippi. The emergency response coordinators was one of the programs that I started with the BT, the bioterrorism grant, that I put in each public health district. And I didn't go hire public health people to be the emergency response coordinators. I went and got police officers, firefighters, paramedics, an ex-military person, someone that was used to responding, and then trained them in public health instead of the other way around. When an emergency happens, we don't have a meeting to talk about it, we respond to it, and then we try to learn from that and make it better. This, I would suggest, is a different approach. Whereas Louisiana was taking their public health workforce and their leadership and training them up, Mississippi was importing expertise in and saying, we'll let you know what public health is, but we want your first response emergency expertise first and foremost, and we want the way you think, live, and breathe to be the way we operate when it comes to being on an emergency footing. So here's the Louisiana official describing their ICS. We set it up in consensus with the incident command structure. You have operations, administration, information officers. Usually you might stand it up for a week. We were in that structure for a month. Communication was a big problem. You had so many factions in the state where they're trying to help. The, the National Guard, State Police, U.S. Public Health Service, FEMA. You got all these entities that had their own jargon. And so you have them here, and you have them talking to each other, but they're not really communicating well because they're speaking jargon that the other doesn't understand. And we heard again and again from particularly the officials in Louisiana at the State Public Health Department how frustrated they were when they were trying to mobilize resources within the state and move them down to where they had to go. And you'll hear a little bit more about that as we go through this. Um, and I would suggest also that even the way they speak about things is different. In Louisiana, they're talking about consensus, which is a very nice public health approach to things. Let's all be friends. Let's talk about consensus. The Mississippi official says, we negotiated a large influx of federal response, national disaster medical system, basically every asset they had, DMAT teams, VMAT teams. We had surgical units from the Air Guard. We had EMAC mobile hospitals. We had mobile primary care, a lot of stuff coming in from the federal government. And it wasn't that difficult for us. They were a great partner for our state. So as far as Mississippi was concerned, smooth sailing the whole way. They put a call in to FEMA, to the feds. Boom, they got what they needed. No problem. So in the days before Katrina, there's the ramping up, the settling per the personal affairs, constant phone calls and communication, opening shelters, deploying assets. The event uh, is the, the day itself is a, a, a Monday morning. 
And uh, so from Friday on, you begin to hear all of this, you know, chatter about what's coming. And by Saturday, public health in both states had already stood up their emergency operations centers. They'd been having conference calls throughout the state, conference calls with the National Weather Centers, um, the Hurricane Centers, Max Mayfield. Everything was up and moving. They were setting up their sheltering system. Good to go. Here's the uh, local incident commander at the Superdome. Uh, speaking. He said, probably one of the interesting parts on Saturday was getting the wife out of here. Of course, she did her wifely thing and begged me not to stay because she knew what the worst case scenario could be. She realized there could be some danger involved if we took a direct hit from Hurricane Katrina. She begged me to go with her. We discussed it a minute and she understood, but she felt that she had to do that and I told her I would be safe. I'd do what I could, but that I needed to stay. And she understood and supported that. You don't realize sometimes you have to make a decision. I'm telling my family, no, I'm sending you on and I'm staying here. You don't realize what it's like when you see your loved one leaving that you're telling them goodbye. And goodbye is the key thing because we weren't 100% sure we'd see each other again. So during Katrina in Louisiana, dealing with the special needs shelters, uh, they, they stood up uh, a shelter where they were not planning to. According to state plans, they do not put a shelter essentially in the path of a hurricane. And if you know the uh, geography and the road system in New Orleans in particular, they absolutely would not put a shelter south of I-10, which is sort of a dividing line for them. The Red Cross absolutely refused to staff a shelter in that area. Where did they put the biggest shelter? South of I-10 in an area unsupported by the American Red Cross because... They had no choice. They had no choice whatsoever. We all remember the, the scenes of the people that were left behind and had to be rescued. And so there was a shelter at the Superdome uh, that was the planned shelter, and it was a combination of a general shelter holding 20 to 30,000 people and a special needs shelter with uh, about 3,000 people. Okay? The largest special needs shelter they had run pri prior to that had about 80. So this now has 3,000 and they had 20 to 30,000 people in a Superdome with the roof coming off, with pandemonium, with uh, electric systems failing in the Superdome, water backing up. That was the scenario. Uh, in both states, obviously, they're dealing with needs of food, shelter, water, fuel, and waste. That's obvious. And in the days after landfall, in Mississippi, uh, they established a forward operations center where they took these, uh, these emergency response coordinators. They moved them down towards the coast. Um, they became somewhat creative when they had to do things. So they broke into a WIC warehouse uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, they needed to get the food to begin to provide the food to the communities because they were having problems uh, establishing enough uh, food supply in the area. And they also used it to, uh, to serve as a stocking and supply center for vaccine and medications. And they deployed the SNS. Uh, they were handling and deploying the volunteers. They were establishing a temporary health care site. So they actually, they had North Carolina's Med One, which is this uh, huge caravan that comes in and sets up a, a mobile medical hospital with 100 beds. Uh, and they deployed teams from uh, Florida Health Department through, uh, through EMAC. And in Louisiana, they did all of that, as well as the consequences of the levee, uh, levee breaking, the flooding, um, extended response phase, and uh, the effort to continue to move 50,000 people out of harm's way. You may remember that a lot of people ended up stuck on the causeway uh, where they were, had been temporarily moved, and they were on this causeway for days, waiting to be uh, having a secondary evacuation. So here's the Mississippi public health official saying, well, we had a physician on the Gulf Coast who works for us, and here's a problem of the upstate downstate problem. He works for the public health department down there. He stands up on CNN. He gives an interview on national TV about we're going to have plagues and pestilence of biblical proportions. And he started requesting that everybody be vaccinated for typhus, tetanus, hep A, and B. And I just refused to do it. I'm not ordering 180,000 doses of everything to sit. We don't have enough refrigeration capabilities and we don't have enough staff to get it out. Then Dick Cheney came to town, and he promised everybody that they could have a tetanus shot. So ultimately, the, uh, the area they gave 139,000 vaccinations compared to an average of 14,000 a year with the drive-by vaccinations. They were not preparing to. They were not planning to. 
it was a little bit of a disconnect, you might say, between the upstate, downstate, and the regional health officer who decided to take matters into his own hands. And you'll, you'll hear him in a couple of slides. Here's a Louisiana public health official. I went to the command center in Baton Rouge to get a feel for what was going on. And that's when we found out what was going on and that there were people that were on I-10 and the causeway and that kind of thing. So we started going out each evening, going to pick up those individuals that were at I-10 and the causeway. This is a public health official running an evacuation operation here. So the buses, and by then I had talked to the state about housing their families because I could see now that I was going to need to continue to use those buses. And I wanted to find a better situation for the bus drivers, families. These young men didn't get on board to do this, but now we became this rescue, this recovery kind of group that went back and forth, back and forth. This woman was a senior public health nurse and became a regional manager in uh, Louisiana, had deep ties in the area, a lot of family living in the Ninth Ward. When she was sent in New, uh, the New Orleans Emergency Operations Center right after Katrina hit and the flooding began, she started getting calls on her cell phone while she's in the EOC. She's getting calls from relatives around the country saying, we just heard from so-and-so, another family member who's in their house, in their attic, the water's rising, what can you do? She could do nothing. So just imagine how you're dealing with the personal and the professional at the same time. She's talking kind of as, you know, somewhat professionally about these bus drivers here, but what happened was Louisiana had planned for convoys of buses, but essentially most of the bus drivers abandoned them initially and then abandoned them secondarily after a single trip from New Orleans up to Baton Rouge, even though they were supposed to keep on cycling back. They didn't. On the spur of the moment, she said, I'll make you a deal. I'll take care of your families. I'll make sure they get the best of what you need. I'll move them up there. I'll safeguard it, and I'll drive up and down between Baton Rouge and New Orleans with you, which she did day after day because she wanted to be the ones to negotiate passage past the National Guard. The Guard was being incredibly vigilant, and they were not letting people back and forth, even buses coming to evacuate people. She had to speak on behalf of these bus drivers. Here's a mid-level worker, mid worker in New Orleans. Another thing is that people who responded were paid from the city. I mean, I came out, I worked, I'm a salaried person because the city had nothing in place. I was paid seven hours a day whether I was working around the clock or not. And then there are those people that did not show up at work at all and they were paid seven hours a day and they, they didn't have to endure anything. You've got to put something in place to compensate those people who are making things happen. I probably don't have to speak with you about union issues. You know, how do you deal with a public health uh, response, emergency response workforce when you have a workforce that says, we clock in at 9 and clock out at 5, and thank you, but that's it? Now, they don't all do that. Clearly, we don't. But there are people that do, and there are people that are going to raise issues like this. There are serious workforce issues. Here's another workforce issue from a senior public health nurse in Louisiana. You know, our workforce is an aging workforce, and I think the mindset of our older nurses was like, okay, this is enough for me. This was the final straw. We'll call it quits after this. And so we've had a lot of our older workforce take early retirement. There was a huge attrition in public health departments in Louisiana, Mississippi, and New Orleans after the event. So in terms of some of the, the processes that were going on here, you had sort of the blended versus specialist approach. Louisiana was the blended, Mississippi the specialist. Tension between ESF aid and essential public health in that uh, many of our informants here talk to us about the problem of trying to do two jobs at the same time. They were often tasked as, as high-level, senior-level folks to be ESF, ESF-8 tasked to do a variety of emergency response tasks. And at the same time, they said, public health, routine public health continues to go on. We still have TBs, STDs, family planning, vaccinations, well child, all of this still is going on and our public health department still has to do it and I still have to do it. I now have two jobs. A lot of tension between ESF-8 and routine public health. Uh, command structures helped, but sometimes were barriers. The Mississippi issue of the upstate downstate, I think, was a very interesting one. The details of the actual response overwhelmed even the most meticulous plans. They had generators, they had the wrong hookup for the generators delivered. So they were useless generators because nobody had thought to look at a specific nature of the, the electrical hookup for the generators being delivered to the shelters. 
and then re response and recovery partners default or abandon their missions, public health was often felt like they were the safety net. When nobody else showed up, the call came to public health. If the hospitals couldn't handle it, the call came to public health. When the mental health agencies didn't show up the way they were supposed to, the call came to public health. Public health was the final backstop. Mass fatality management, they were not really prepared for this at all, call came to them. Here's uh, the Mississippi public health official talking about one of the dangers of maybe overextending. It's a little long, but bear with me. Our people were, became not only ESFA, but they were pulled into virtually every aspect of response simply because we had communication, because our field personnel are cross-trained in fire and law enforcement and emergency management and several other things. They're not public health people. They're emergency response people, and they support public health. So they were able to mold, if you will, into every environment they needed to be in and be of assistance in many different ways. But the problem is one that I call feeding the dog. And we have to be careful to stay on track with our mission as ESF-8 and push back, if you will, on some of those issues where it's like feeding the dog. You feed it one time, it's going to come back every time after that. In some cases, we did declare public health hazards, depending on the incident. Two million pounds of chicken on the ground is a public health hazard. But at the same time, they wanted public health people on the scene documenting and this and that. And we said, look, we can't be everywhere all the time. We'll declare it a hazard, and then you need to handle it. So we had some issues like that, just an example of feeding the dog. Louisiana, here was a, a woman who was a physician, very accomplished, who was brought to the point of tears because of the frustration she felt trying to make things happen. And she was extended herself for so many weeks on end, it was unbelievable. And this is what she came as one of her little lessons learned. She says, I finally figured out over the summer why anything I did worked. And that was because I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how not to say no which is different from figuring out how to say yes. It's different in that you don't know what you're gonna to do to get around saying no. You just have to get off the phone and figure it out. And then as she started talking about decision making, she said, I never had to do anything alone. There was always somebody on the other end of the phone. I never had to make decisions by myself, which is good because you shouldn't be. You shouldn't feel like you're alone in the wilderness. I think what you hear from her and what you hear from the Mississippi folks Two very different approaches. This is somebody inculcated in, you know, the consensus process, public health leadership. But this is what her feeling was, and she was incredibly dedicated and devoted. Uh, this, by the way, is the regional health director who uh, called for all the vaccinations down in the, the Mississippi Gulf Coast. He said, he's a real character. He goes, uh, so I got with all the county and city attorneys. He gets them all together, and he said, I can't reach my people up there in Jackson. Honestly, he didn't want to and was trying not to. Uh, in the state capitol because they don't know what the hell they're doing anyway. So let's just, we're going to have to solve this. You think somebody from Jackson or the attorney general's office is going to come down here and help you in six months? Are you kidding me? We have to. I have to make decisions here and you have to back me. So they said, fine, because I know them personally. I belong to all the clubs they belong to because I don't see public health maybe as most people do. I see it as a bridge, as a table. It's not the haves and have nots. I sit at the table, all the meetings. I am the table. I am the table. That is probably the best description of public health I've ever heard. I am the table. So now I'm going to turn to a different perspective. That was public health providers. Now let's look at some of the data from what happened to people. So we're going to look a little bit at the Gulf Coast Family and Health Study. A child and family health study, which is a representative sample of uh, folks who had been displaced and greatly affected. It's representative of about 100,000 people. Uh, we recruited them within uh, the first year after the hurricane. We went back uh, four successive times to talk to people. Uh, the last time we went back, we had a retention rate of almost 88 percent, which is astonishing to continue finding people after all that time. We had uh, a little over 400 households with kids. Um, I wouldn't be a director of research if I didn't show you a real research graph. So here's a survival analysis of how long it takes to get into stable housing amongst people who were displaced by Hurricane Katrina. On average, 917 days on average to get into stable housing. Prior to that, transient housing, uh, emergency sheltering, FEMA trailers, not knowing where you're going to be, not knowing what your future will be. 
And then if you distinguish, the two curves here distinguish between people with good mental health and poor mental health. The people with good mental health, it's the bottom curve, get into stable housing faster than the people with poor mental health. It's not entirely clear which direction things are going here. Do you have poor mental health because you don't have stable housing, or do you not have stable housing because you have poor mental health? It's a reasonable question. The projected rate of housing stability, it would take at least six years to get about 95% of the people into stable housing, six years after the event, meaning now, this year, we should be hitting around the 95% rate. And the, un the consequences of unstable housing for the folks in, uh, in the cohort in these, this representative sample of 100,000, people living in unstable housing were 2.3 times as likely to report to mental health disability, almost twice as likely to report a child with emotional problems, three times as likely to have a poor sense of community, which you can understand if you knew where they were living and the uh, transiency, almost twice as likely to have a child whose academic performance was worse than uh, after the hurricane than before, almost twice as likely not to have adequate social support. And all of those items that I just uh, described are true whether or not you have income above or below $20,000. It's not a matter of income. It's a matter of housing. So when we look at uh, how well kids were doing, you could look at how many of the kids um, were not in age-appropriate grades. So you could see here that in general in the South, about 18.5% of kids um, are one or a year more too old for their grade. In this post-Katrina world with our kids that we were looking at, over a third were too old for the grade. We were looking at 13-year-old sixth graders. There's a real problem when you have this mix. It's hard on the kid. It's impossible on the kid. It's hard on the teacher, because you can imagine the behavioral and developmental issues that occur when you have older kids mixed in. Think about the behaviors that they're modeling for these younger kids. Think about how they feel about themselves and how that whole environment works. Not well. When we looked at chronic disease and other uh, health issues amongst the kids, when we compared it with um, a national norm, the National Survey of Child Health, bottom line is, the asthma went up a little bit amongst the kids after Katrina, but that was not the big issue. The big issues happened to be depression, anxiety, and behavioral or conduct problems, where they went up three and fourfold uh, amongst these kids. And then when we look at uh, the, the kids' mental health overall, you have to think that overall you had 160,000 kids who were displaced for three or more months, many for months or years. Two years after the event, there were still 55,000 um, that were not, uh, that the school systems in their home communities were below their, their pre-Katrina enrollment rates, um, and that this displacement itself represents a long-term toxic exposure. The uncertainty, the uncertainty in and of itself is something to be thinking about. So when you look at the, the portrait of kids' lives over time, so you can see, all right, the good news about percent living in a trailer or a hotel, well, it's going down from 06, it was 84%, all the way down to 8% in 09, 10, 10. That's great. Um, but the proportion of parents who say they're not coping well with their parenting skills, that hasn't changed. And the national average is 2 to 3%, and we've got 13% there. Parents with mental health distress, well, the good news is it went down from 60% to 42%, and the bad news is 42% is astonishingly high figure for parents with mental health distress. The percent of parents who said their kids were not safe in school, that didn't go down, still around 30%. And the percent who moved in the past year, well, the first year, obviously, almost 100% were moving, and it kept going down, and by four and a half years after the hurricane, half the people were still moving in the past year. The national average is about 15 to 18% of people move on average in any given year. So our findings when we looked at uh, the kids' mental health is that household stress has made a difference, and most particularly, the parents' Uh, mental health had the greatest effect on the kids. The social disorder on their community had a substantial effect. Prior social adversity, meaning what their lives were like before the hurricane, because most people will say, well, look where they came from. They probably had such bad lives beforehand. Well, when we look at it with uh, statistical controls, the answer is that's not the answer. That's not making the difference. It's regardless whether they had social adversity pre prior to the hurricane, they were still having serious problems. In the last time we talked to them, four and a half years after the hurricane, we had over a third of the kids reporting serious emotional disturbance. Uh, that's about four and a half, five times as high as the national average. Four and a half to five times as high. It's, just, it's an astonishing number. So now, 
I want to take a couple of minutes and uh, sort of show you some life stories as part of our life story project. Uh, it began as a very straight up intervention research project where we said, okay, we're going to randomly assign people to cases and controls. It was a test of something called testimony therapy, that if you have an opportunity to talk about an event, this came out of actually Holocaust survivors. Uh, here at Yale, in fact, is where the, uh, uh, the gentleman who really pioneered this thought. If you have a chance to talk about it, it's therapeutic. You can help get over it. You can recover quickly, et cetera, gain your self-efficacy. That's the theory. So we took a group split them into case controls, randomized them, gave one set the opportunity to do this uh, life story video, uh, and then to, we gave them the DVD to, to watch and share with the family and friends, and the other set did not get the life story video. They didn't do that at all. And we followed them over time to see if there were any differences in self-efficacy, resiliency, post-traumatic growth. Um, and the answer was, uh, in terms of research, there was no difference after two years. It didn't show the difference. So you might say, well, you know, that's too bad, and maybe we did a bad job measuring things, et cetera. But there was something about the life stories itself, and that's why I want to show you this, which is what do people talk about when they talk about a disaster? They talk about crisis moments, the burden of displacement and isolation. They talk a lot about relationships, and they talked about using the life story as a, as a means to communicate with others and their family. So if you'll bear with me for a second. Let's, this is about a nine-minute clip, but... I, I think it's worth us seeing. You know, there, there was a lot of help for everybody, you know, but as time goes along, it's like those people that need the most help are, are beginning to kind of be left behind. Have you ridden the coast recently or anything? Yeah, it's all cleaned up. You know, people say, oh, it's cleaned up, looks great, you know? But there's nothing coming, there's nothing, there's no rebuilding going on. Everybody says, oh, they're, they're rebuilding this, they're rebuilding that. This. It's simply not happening. And in New Orleans, it's even, it's so much worse, you know, and they're getting a bum rush. I got caught in it. You know? That was something I never experienced. I help some people, I pull some people out, you know? I try to do what's right there. I could have just left and just didn't matter to me. They didn't care about nobody else but myself, but I, something just made me stay. And to this day, I still, you know, I think it was the Lord, I don't know, but it made me the kind of person I am. I really, I help anybody if I can. Um, it was time I was pulling through the water, I was slipping when I am under the boat, I almost drowned. Couldn't find my daughter. She, I... Well, my husband was leaving. I told him I wasn't. And he said, well, I'll come back and bury you. I said, well, I'll leave if they tell me it's mandatory, then we'll leave. I said, but if my kids don't go, I'm not going. I'm not leaving nobody behind. We either all go or we all get buried at the same time. They called and told us that we had to leave, and I was helping. We had a lot of everybody over here picking up stuff and bringing in stuff. And I went into the house and I asked my husband, so where are you going? He says, well, we have to evacuate. I said, well, you have to wait. I got to call the kids. So I, we all decided to leave. And we went to Philadelphia, Mississippi and stayed there until the Wednesday after. And then we went, we moved like seven times before we really got to come, you know, a stable place. My name is Travels, was torn apart and in my yard. And in my little place, I stayed in a little field. I guess you call it apartment shed, and it got blown apart and scattered across the road. You see where a tornado come through, topped all the trees and hit my little spot, and wiped everything out and threw it everywhere. Well, yeah, I had a bunch of trees, couldn't get a driveway, uh, no electricity. The only thing that was left some kind of way was my vacuum cleaner. That's the only thing that was left. And uh, just a whole lot of cleanup, man. Big, huge pine trees and a uh, bunch of wild boar running around the neighborhood. It was pretty quiet, I remember that. No dogs, no cats, no crickets. The only thing we see was mosquitoes and gnats. We survived a lot of the storms down here. A couple of them didn't bother us too much and then finally Katrina came along. And I would have left only my daughter wouldn't leave. So I stayed because of her and my 
grandchildren, great grandchildren. I stayed here. Fortunately, I'm glad I did because we had eight foot of water in this area. I have an attic, they do not. Thirteen of us were up in my attic, thirteen of us and two dogs for two days. And how big were the dogs? My one dog was a um, Rottweiler, he was a 160 pound dog. Uh, unfortunately, Katrina took him. Uh, I have a French poodle, which is still in the house with me, so I still have him. Uh, we stayed in the attic for two days. Came down, uh, I put up a large lean to outside. We lived outside, all of us, for a week. Were you okay, Katrina? Everything was okay. I was okay. I was okay with the apartment we was living in, the space, you know. After Hurricane Katrina, it was like we had to start all over, and I hated that. It was hard. Right now, I, I used to talk a lot, but I'm a whole lot quieter now. I don't say too much. And as far as my children go, I think they had gotten a little better, but their anger, they have a whole lot of anger towards, you know, each other to where I got to the point where y'all gonna have to, you know, stop all that arguing because if I'm not here, y'all have each other. And if y'all gonna bicker with each other like this all your life, y'all not gonna make it. Like give just sometimes I just feel like I just give up. I just I sit like I said, I'm just sitting in the trail and that wasn't like me when I was um before the storm. I was out going for it and kinda of looking around, I was gone, I was always trying to, how they say, get my hustle on legally. That's legally now. <laughs> and it's not unlegal. But you can understand that. We never know what's going on from one day to the next, really. Women are moving. It's, you, you're like we're in a constant state of limbo, pretty much. You don't, and that, that really, that messes with you psychologically. Because it's like, man, what's going to go on tomorrow? You know, is the little FEMA man going to come by and give me that yellow paper? Or... <laughs> <laughs> so you never know what's up, but at least we know y'all think about us a lot, and that makes us feel good, and we appreciate it. <laughs> I was just in shock that they had so many people at CAD, you know, that riding around, you know, old ladies that knit, knitted blankets together and quilts, and, you know, I've uh, never seen anybody do that before, you know, because this place really wasn't like that before the hurricane. Everybody stuck to themselves and, you know, didn't really mingle that much. But after the hurricane, everybody mingled, you know. It's, uh, everybody has, it. and if, they, if somebody give them something and they got too much, that passed on down to the next person that needed something, you know, it's, everybody was open hands. It was pretty good. It was a good feeling. You know, you hear people complaining about, you know, not getting this, not getting that. Instead of going, look at what what people do. Just because you did a bump in the road and you think you've been forgotten, you just can't give up. We had to make do for ourselves in most cases. My grandmother used to tell me she wanted me to be a preacher. Uh, I never did make the preacher business, but of course, I didn't turn into a car salesman either. But uh, she said sometimes you have to put faith in this place. And you know, I've always been a hard working person. You know, I've always, I had a goal in my mind and I always tried to reach that goal. And even though I'd get down sometimes and get beat up and things would get taken away from me and you know, things didn't work out right, I never missed what my goal was and what I was trying to accomplish in life. So actually, the um, the older couple in there that are sitting together, they were not married at the time of uh, the hurricane. They met each other on Match.com. <laughs> just, just incredible to me. Uh, I'm going to finish up with just a, a couple of things here. Which is coming back to this 
to sort of tie it all together, so what exactly was public health doing three days after the hurricane? Now you've seen the stories, you've heard the stories of the people, public health providers. What were they doing three days after the hurricane? Continuity of operations. They were trying to find their workforce. That was a huge effort. Where were people? They didn't even know. They were concerned about their own families and the workforce itself. In New Orleans, this is an incredible story. The Louisiana State Health Department maintained the birth and death records in a building in New Orleans, and the, the uh, vital statistics records were kept in the basement. And so the woman who was the director of vital statistics the days after Hurricane Katrina had mustered together a volunteer crew to work frantically to take those vital records out. They were underwater. These are, they don't have an electronic uh, scanned version of these, so these are the only records that people had existed. Okay? She ended up going to a warehouse, stringing lines across the warehouse like clothing lines, and hanging each one of the vital records up to dry. They managed to save a good portion, but not all, but that's what she was doing three days after the hurricane. Supply chain, making sure they were getting the, the medications, the uh, equipment, methadone, for the addictive disorders. That was a huge issue. How are you gonna handle that? How are you gonna handle the HIV AIDS patients who need to have their antiretroviral therapy? How do you handle the dialysis patients? Secondary evacuations were happening, quite a few of them at this point, from hospitals, shelters, from the causeway that you heard before. In the hospitals, the hospital ICUs and other units were calling that incident commander at the Superdome and saying, I can't handle these patients anymore. Can you take them off my hands? That's not what a public health special needs shelter is designed to do. And the guy said, I will, of course. If you can't handle them, we'll figure out a way. And they did figure out a way to take them and transport them. Again, an unanticipated role and function for that particular public health uh, provider. Special needs shelters, as we talked about, mass fatality management, family reunification, that mass vaccination campaign that was going on in Mississippi, not expected. Water, wastewater, food inspection happening, I mean, incredibly at this point. They had so much uh, food that they had, they had to inspect, condemn, et cetera. They had to make sure they had the potable water. They had to make sure they had the engineers back to, uh, to get the pumping stations back online. There was a lot going on there. And then the volunteer management was an enormous effort. So obviously, if you look at these things and you, you sort of say, yeah, okay, I recognize all those things. They're all on our ESFA chart. We have people to do them. That's good. But just think about it. It's at a magnitude well above what you're going to what you're going to face. So in terms of lessons learned, I have sort of two parts to this. Lesson part one is that routine public health will continue no matter what. So that you know, there's a there's a Zen saying that before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. That's it. It just keeps going on. Routine public health continues. Uh, vulnerable populations may be particularly vulnerable, such as those with the addictive disorders or chronic health conditions, and you may have newly vulnerable populations that you had not been thinking about before, like kids, or like seniors who are otherwise healthy. Um, uncertainty in and of itself will be probably the longest lasting toxin or stressor for both providers and the affected uncertainty in every aspect. And culture matters. When I say culture, I mean social culture, your organizational culture. We talked about the culture differences between Louisiana, Mississippi State Health Departments. All of that matters. The difference between uh, union workers and, and management, that matters. How different cultures think about things. You heard all the voices of those, uh, the life stories. Culture matters. And now for the part two lessons. One, disasters clearly require leadership and initiative at all levels. So leadership does not simply mean one person way at the top of a chain of command issuing an order. It means taking responsibility, recognizing that you are responsible, figuring out what the critical decisions are to be made, having situational awareness. That's part of being a leader. Secondly, Disasters require public health responders to be able to assimilate new information and communicate effectively. So managing and communicating information is critical. And there are any number of ways that you're going to have to be able to do this above and beyond your conventional ways of doing it. Three, disasters require public health responders to plan on the fly all the time. 
and planning on the fly can't be too ad hoc. It has to be somewhat well thought out. So it probably is worthwhile spending a little bit of time training how to do this kind of planning, this contingency planning and the emergency planning. And lastly, disasters require the ability to know your own limits and to be sensitive to the welfare of others, whether it's the welfare of your coworkers, your colleagues, those who work for you, those who you work for, and certainly the population that you are responsible for. And uh, with that, I think I have a couple of minutes in case there are any questions. We have uh, about five, 10 minutes if there are comments or questions. I actually uh, lived and worked in New Orleans. I did my residency at Charity Hospital. And I went through a, a almost hurricane there where we had no power for three days. We had flooding. And I think the problem with New Orleans was that we always knew that this was a possibility. But hurricanes came or almost came, and the levees always held. So from my perspective, the biggest problem that uh, New Orleans faced was complacency because they knew what could happen, but it, it, it hadn't happened. And so people, when the uh, evacuation orders come, people just ignore them, as you heard the individuals say. Um, you know, they thought about evacuating, but unless somebody was going to come and take them out of their home forcibly, they weren't going to do it. I think that other areas have the same issue of complacency. So how do we keep the public motivated? Um, because even though you know the threat, it, the threat doesn't seem to be real. You know what I'm saying? That may be one of the most challenging aspects is how to make the threat salient to the public. Um, I mean, you know, you could show them even something like, you know, the life stories, and they'll go, oh, that's really touching, but that's not going to happen here. That's not me. That's a different culture. We're not at the same risk. And yet, you know, we heard Dr. Gornitz present on, you know, the possibility of what the sea level rise could be here, and it is substantial and scary. Um, and in fact, she mentioned uh, the really critical aspect of communicating this kind of vulnerability, not only to the decision makers, but to the public. And I think that's an ongoing challenge of risk and public health communication generally is how to get people aware. And I think you probably have to have constantly new ways of engaging the public to think about it slightly differently. If you use the same message all the time, it won't work. That's clear. I just have a comment. Um, a compelling statement that you made was that the American Red Cross would not set up a shelter mm -hmm. at a certain place. Right. And I think that, to your point just made, in trying to reach the public, when you make a statement like that, people listen. And we know who the American Red Cross is, and most of the people in the United States know who the American Red Cross are. So if you're going to reach people with a statement and trying to change their mind and get them out of that complacency, that, out of all of what was said this morning, stuck with me, because I would say that to people. You, they will not set up a shelter here. People will hear that, because they know who the American Red Cross is, they're international. And if you don't allow that information to be known ahead of time, mm -hmm. it can't help you in a disaster. So I think that's a statement that should be resounding. If the American Red Cross has made a statement that they will not do something, I think people would listen to that. Yeah, I, I think that could be true. I, I wonder what, by a show of hands, how many people here think that the evacuation of New Orleans was a failure? So there was a fair number of hands that went up. So they evacuated 80% of the city, which, you know, by almost any measure is astonishing to evacuate 80% of a city. New York City will never evacuate 80%. Long Island, you know, I can't imagine how they'd be able to evacuate 80% of Long Island. Um, so I think the people that, you know, to some extent, people did hear some of those messages. They did move out of harm's way. And some of the, the systems were not in place that were supposed to be in place to get people to move. And that communication did not occur. There were uh, Amtrak trains that were ready to take people out of there that were deadheaded to go out of uh, the Gulf Coast, never used. All the buses that ended up not being used because the drivers abandoned their posts. So it's 
Not always the case that people didn't want to leave, it's that they couldn't leave. Now, clearly, there were plenty of people who didn't leave. And you know, would they have been moved to leave if they knew that the American Red Cross and therefore the city would not set up a shelter? I think that's an open question, and I would say you're still going to have people that are going to stay, but your point is, do you, do you say something and stick to it, essentially? Uh, and I think the city and the state felt that they, they couldn't. They had a responsibility to the people. And look, the convention center opened up as uh, you know, a shelter without anybody opening it as a shelter. It just happened. I think one of the final messages that people are now starting to hear from emergency responders is, if you don't leave, we're not coming back to get you. And that's a very solid message. That's like what the lady said, that that sticks in your mind and makes you think. It could get this bad, and if it does, and I change my mind, or I have no choice, I may be stuck here. That makes people think. Mm -hmm. And it's being seen more and more, because before, the old, the old adage was, if they stayed, we would still try and get you. But now it's becoming more and more the mantra, if you stay, we're not coming for you. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, we, we actually at our center conducted a national survey. We've done this annually for a number of years, looking at uh, preparedness, attitudes, and behaviors. And after Katrina, we asked the question, in the event of a major catastrophe or disaster, um, how long do you think it'll take for first responders, uh, military, National Guard, fire police, et cetera, EMS, to come to your, to your aid? Do you think they'll be within the hour, within a few hours, within a day, et cetera? Um, Two-thirds of the people in the country believe that first response in a catastrophe will be there within a few hours. That includes, we oversampled Louisiana, Mississippi County's hardest hit by Katrina. They also said, two-thirds of them said, within a few hours. New York City residents, three-quarters of New York City residents said, first response will be here within a few hours. I would say that's a little misguided, but yeah. There's a follow-up with that? Interestingly, too, how many people, do you know, I forgot what the number was, how many first responders left their posts? 40% mm -hmm. uh, or something like right. that, police, right. fire. Um, so a lot of the public don't realize that that could happen as well. Right. You know, not to mention uh, when we talk about different scenarios in public health, like a pandemic, one of the things we kept saying is, you know, expect 40% of the workforce to be out to try and drive people to prepare at home. Right, at least 40%. I think we have time for one more question. Is yeah. there another question over here? Wait, let's, well, wait, wait, wait maybe we can get a. There's one here, yeah. <laughs> Sir, I, I was just, yeah, all the way in the back. Okay, so yeah. two questions then, one, and then we'll do the last one here. Okay, I was just curious, uh, you did some, it looks like you did some great research on Katrina and certainly the post effects on it. I'm just kind of curious, uh, would your organization be doing similar research uh, on some of the similar um, uh, patterns with regards to the Joplin disaster and some of those others that uh, also will have long-term effects where entire communities, not to the magnitude obviously of New Orleans, but certainly entire communities literally wiped, wiped off the face of the earth, if you will. Yeah, uh, actually we, we are beginning that type of research already. We've got uh, at least one of our faculty members who went down uh, to Tuscaloosa to begin some formative work looking at pediatric death and injury uh, in the area. There were 20 pediatric deaths uh, in the series of tornadoes that hit, which is an astonishingly high number. Um, and looking at not just for Joplin, but for all those, uh, the southern tornadoes in Alabama and in Missouri, uh, what were the factors that led to warnings being heated? Um, systems in place for sheltering, you know, uh, emergency systems, health systems, etc. So we are looking into that. So, okay, so one last question. Um, in, in your research, did you find any information on people requesting uh, evacuation assistance who were homebound after the declaration? Did, or, do you have any, any visibility on that community of people in New Orleans? I, I don't have that. Um, what I can say, although it's not in direct response to that, is 
my field team, we had about 25 to 30 interviewers who do this study, were astonished with how many people with disabilities they met down there. It was so high, uh, physical disabilities uh, and chronic health disabilities to the point where, or just untreated. I mean, we, we had one elderly gentleman who suffered a stroke and he refused to go to the hospital, and so he was living in his trailer having suffered a stroke and was debilitated because of it and was refusing care. Um, and that kind of story was not as unusual as you would have thought. Uh, it's, I mean, it's striking to us here to hear that, but that was not uh, surprising. And I think there was like 30 or 40 percent of the adults we talked to had some disability. Uh, so 